dealing with predatory journals, dealing with paper mills, dealing with plagiarism, that they're not something that one journal can handle, that they're just swamped. So it has to be system wide. And you know, that's the irony is that those those major publishers, they're using AI to combat AI. You know, they're using AI in many good ways to improve systems and flow and, and everything. I mean, even going back to choosing peer review. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Sites Exchange. I'm your host, Nikesh Gosalia. Today, we have the privilege of speaking with Joan Marsh, editor-in-chief of The Lancet Psychiatry, and a distinguished figure in the realm of science editing and publishing. Joan brings a wealth of experience and leadership to our conversation. As editor-in-chief of The Lancet Psychiatry, Joan plays a pivotal role in shaping the journal's trajectory. Her journey in academia and publishing began with a degree in natural sciences from Cambridge University, followed by a PhD in molecular biology. With a background that includes editorial roles at prestigious institutions like the SIBA slash Novartis Foundation in London and John Wiley & Sons, Joan's expertise spans across various facets of academic publishing. In addition to her role at the Lancet Psychiatry, Joan has made significant contributions to academic publishing through the European Association of Science Editors, more famously known as EAS, where she served as president for six years and chaired the Gender Policy Committee. Her commitment to promoting diversity and excellence in peer review underscores her dedication to advancing scholarly communication. Today, we are excited to delve into Joan's insights, experiences, and vision for the future of academic publishing. So without further ado, let's welcome Joan Marsh to the show. Welcome, Joan. Thank you very much, Mikesh. Pleasure to be here. Brilliant. So let's get started. Uh, let me s start by asking you a little bit about your journey as a science editor. And uh, from what I remember, you started way back in 1987, when the internet itself was just emerging. So can you tell us a little bit about your experience of academic publishing through the years? And are there any key changes that you've seen? Yes. So I literally started editing on paper and we cut and paste. So when you have an app that says cut and paste, I used a pair of scissors and a little quick stick glue. So when we were editing manuscripts, it was pencil and a rubber, not red ink because you needed to change your mind. But I also edited transcripts of conversations and that's when we would cut and paste. And the other thing is in proofs, when you check proofs, if you wanted to change something, in those days, they would literally strip out the line and put in another typeset line because it was metal type. So you had to make sure that your change could fit in a line. So if you added a word, you needed to shorten something else because otherwise you'd be changing the whole paragraph. So yeah, life was quite slow in those days. And we got terribly excited when we had a fax machine and we could talk to the Americans in almost real time. And then gradually we had word processors so we could each do our editing. And of course now everything is available at the touch of a button. But instead of us having more time, we just seem to get more work done and deadlines get tighter. And so the technology has changed, but the pressures to get manuscripts out in a hurry has just intensified. That's a brilliant insight, Joe. And uh, probably I also did not give that so much of thought in terms of, on one end, the efficiency seems to have improved, or it, it should have been with technology, but probably because of just the pressure of getting everything right, understanding the technology first, adopting to it, and then using it, we all feel more pressurized. Uh, are there any other key changes that come to your mind, Joan, when you look back uh, over the last 37 odd years? I think what's... To building more on what I was just saying is that, and, and it, it goes on to current excitement about AI and things, we still need people. So again, when I started, my editorial assistant used to have to go down to our print library and check references in print volume. And she checked every one. And then when we went, people started to use tools like a 
reference manager. And an author would say, my references are correct because I use a tool. Yes, but they're not correct because you've entered the data incorrectly. And, and I think that's the same now. People are saying, well, oh, I use a tool, therefore my writing is accurate or my, my references are correct or my figure is right. And it's not because you haven't designed it properly. So if you don't enter data correctly, the tool can't regurgitate them correctly. And if you don't plan what you're doing, it, it can't be right. However, you can have a beautifully written paper that you use AI to help you write. But if your thinking isn't clear behind that, you're not going to have a clear message and a well, you know, a well written paper in the sense of a well designed structured paper that tells your story. So I, I think although the technologies change, I like to think that as editors, we'll still have jobs, but we'll still have jobs because authors are still required and authors need to make that input and then we need to help them to produce the best paper possible absolutely i fully agree with you joan i think um, the input is still extremely important and so is the interpretation of that output and and uh, you know essentially how do you use that i think you've partly answered my next question but in case if you want to build on that so in with all of these technologies that are emerging how would one navigate this very fine line between embracing innovation, you don't want to be left out as well, but at the same time, maintaining the integrity of traditional publishing practices that have been built over so many centuries, and that too, particularly in the field of mental health research? So in mental health research, the big movement at the moment is the inclusion of people with lived experience of mental illness and that is at all stages so the ideal is that they are involved in designing the project co-design from the very start so which questions are you going to ask in this study and are those questions important to the person living with mental illness and then through to running the study writing the paper we have people involved in peer review and perhaps commenting on the paper from a third person perspective so that that lived experience voice comes through. Now, if you look at the statistics of people with mental illness, many, many of our authors in academia who are just there as researchers, they also have mental illness. Some of it's declared, some is not. So some people are known to experience depression or schizophrenia and they're an academic first and they're an academic with schizophrenia other people it's not disclosed or that some people might know it but they don't declare it but then you've got other people who are not academics didn't go through the university system and train but are coming in as lived experience experts and i think the move in in mental health research and service delivery you know it's it's not just the research end it's them putting this into practice is to how we combine all those voices, integrate them, and do so in an equitable and fair way. And the problem we're encountering is that because these people are not academics, we need to reimburse their time. So the Lancet journals, we have statistical reviewers for every paper, every research paper, and we pay those. It's not a lot, but we pay them because they are doing that as a service. So they're not benefiting from doing the peer review whereas for clinicians we think and researchers think you are benefiting because you're reading a good paper and you're providing input but you see the paper early and hopefully you would want to read this paper at some point anyway and you will publish papers and other people will do peer review but when you get these non-academic experts by lived experience they're not benefiting in the same way it doesn't help their career and it's a huge amount of time commitment because they're not professionals. They're not trained in critical reading. So they're not speed reading. They, you know, it might take them much longer. And you know, some of ours, they say, it takes me two or three days to review a paper. I'm going, oh, don't do. And also, it can be disturbing for them. So sometimes, you know, if they want, they want to read papers about their own illness and their own disorder types. But they say, you know, I'm reading this and it, I have to go and literally go and lie down. Again, we, we pay them a little bit, but 
it's nothing in comparison to the the effort and things they're putting in. And and this is something that academia or that the publishing world isn't tackling. So we're saying we want to bring in these voices, but if we're going to do that, we do need to think about the whole structure of how we're paying and reimbursing. And it's I don't have the answers, but I know we're raising the questions, which is very important. So that's more mental health than publishing. But it is publishing because we're, we're, we're bringing them into publishing. Oh, it is. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I think that's that's a very interesting perspective, uh, Joan. And I love the fact that you mentioned that, yes, we don't have all the answers yet, but it's very important to raise these questions and discuss and, and you know try and figure out as a community of how we're going to really solve for this. And just building on that and to delve a little bit deeper into your current role as editor-in-chief of The Lancet Psychiatry, you oversee a platform that plays a significant role in shaping mental health discourse. From your perspective, how do you perceive the role of academic journals in advancing mental health awareness and destigmatizing the mental health issues through scholarly communications? We do it in various ways, I suppose. So, so in terms of the destigmatization, changing public health awareness, that we can do through reaching out to the general public. So that that's public education, and we're we're lucky there at Nancet. We've got a fantastic communications team, press office, so we can get press releases out, work with journalists. So in the UK, the Welcome has this science media center and so they will now do briefings so if we've got something that's contentious or that needs explaining in some way then then the science media center they would organize a meeting and it used to be just those journalists based in London who would come to the welcome and have a cup of coffee and listen in person but COVID of course opened it up so now those media center briefings are global which is fantastic because we can reach a much better audience so that's a sort of the, the elite end. Obviously, there's social media pushing out, working with the authors to help them do that. We, we don't do a huge amount, but we, we try to keep that. We do a monthly podcast where one of the authors, sets of authors, talks about their paper in more depth. And giving these voices to people to, to write. So we have a, a very small magazine section and... We basically have three elements to it now. So one is a profile where we profile usually a psychiatrist, researcher some way, but it might be someone involved in policy. And then we have one essay that is written by someone with lived experience. And it's talking about how living with mental illness has given them insight into their condition, their life, their experiences. So it's not just, I have this disorder and this is how I feel, what happens to me. It, 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 it's supposed to have a learning message in there. And we don't go out and seek these. They come in. People, sometimes like my editorial board might contact me and say, one of my patients, she's amazing. She's got this fantastic story to tell. Others, they just arrive and we work with them and develop them. And I find those stories really moving and I'm not a clinician. I'm not a med. I'm not medically trained. So for me, that's really good insight into patients, and it reminds me, you know, what what this is all about. We're not just publishing epidemiology and trials and systematic reviews. There are people in the end of this. So those ways of just sort of passively spreading the message. We also do. We work with other organisations externally. So the big one we did in India a couple of years ago was we worked. So Lakshmi Vijaya Kumar is on my editorial board, our editorial board, and has been from the start. She's a good friend. And she has been working for a long time on a national suicide prevention plan for India. And she wrote the review. And then it was during COVID when we had to push a lot of things back. So we actually sat on her review for six months after acceptance, which is very rare. But that sort of gave a bit more time and then we published the review. She organised a meeting in Delhi for members of the Indian Parliament. Then six months later, she had another one. And then finally, that went through and India has a National Suicide Prevention Plan. So that's a combination of the, the authors are doing the work. We support by publishing. 
we can support by spreading the message, but we can also support. So I dialed into the meeting in Delhi and, and said something and, and just giving that support. And it, it comes down to a question of time. And it's talking with the authors, you know, what can I do for your paper that's most useful? Because it's not always what you'd suggest. So with, with the suicide prevention paper, Lakshmi would say, we would say, should we do this? She'd say, no, no, that's not a good idea. No, we have to work gradually with the politicians and get them on side. And it's a, it's a wooing process and developing those relationships, not coming in saying, you must do this. So... Yeah, so that we we can be influential, but it's it can be a slow process, and it's also very hard to gauge. I mean, that one had a hard endpoint. National policy was changed; it would have been changed eventually, and we may have helped it happen more quickly. There are other things where you you publish a paper and you just don't know what happens to it. You know, people's got citations. If it's cited, usually that's great. If it gets a press release and it's out there, that's great. But there are others and you think, did anybody read that? Does anybody? And then you might be talking with the author two or three years later and they say, oh, yeah, we get loads of good feedback on that paper. People say it really helped them write their grants and you know the sort of more position papers and commissions we do, that they are being used, but we're not necessarily aware of that. So it's that's... That's interesting, and that, that just means you've got to be out in your community, A, to hear what what's happening to what you've published, and then also to pick up the vibes for what's coming next and, and what areas we need to be in, investing in and developing. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that uh, as an example, Joan. That's, uh, that's very inspiring, and to be part of changing a national-level uh, policy, that's amazing. And I think from our experience also more recently, talking to a whole set of publishers and societies, we are seeing something similar, where a lot of these societies are also saying we've got fantastic science, maybe it's a bit complex, but you know we want to give life to it. And so we are using some of the derivative assets, like it could be a, sh a short video, it could be a simplified infographic, it could be some of those plain language summaries, to just bring that awareness not only to you know their peers and, and the kind of the so-called technical community, but even lay audiences. And the whole idea is for everyone to just get an understanding of some of these amazingly well-written, well-researched uh, science topics, which, yeah, like you mentioned, either are behind paywall or even after open access, there's just so much content available out there that it's very, very difficult to really identify some of these. So, yeah, I think that's a similar trend that we are seeing as well. Just moving on, uh, Joan, I think... Academic journals shape research trends, for example, in the field of mental health. But from a journal editor's point of view, what responsibilities do editors have in guiding these trends? There's lots of little things we can do to improve reporting. So the, the main thing I've been involved with, which was really ease, uh, was sex and gender reporting. So when I was president of these at one of our conferences, Shirin Haidari came up to me. She was a new member and she said, Joan, Ease needs a gender policy group committee. And I was like, oh, do we? Okay. Uh, so Shirin set up the committee and then they developed the sex and gender reporting guidelines. So we were aware of this in medicine, that the story at the time in medicine was that the all the cardiovascular drugs, were developed in trials on white men. The lidomide had been brought in as a drug for morning sickness for women and then had awful effects on the children. So after that, the, the research community knew that drugs could be detrimental to the fetus. So basically, women were excluded from clinical trials in case they got pregnant and then damaged the fetus. So if drug companies just did trials on men, they were white men, mainly you know, in cardiovascular of a certain age, and then every the drugs are licensed, and then they're prescribed to everybody on that basis. We knew that was happening, and there was a campaign to get more women into trials and to do this. And, and what Shearing's group were trying to do was, was get sex and gender reporting in there. So we produced the guidelines. They were published in 2016, and for quite a long time, it felt like not much was happening. 
So we kept saying, how do we get journalists to endorse? We were giving presentations and talking about them and encouraging ease journals to use them. And it still just felt like not a lot. You know, it was slowly, slowly. Then I joined the Lancet and I said, can we get this? And and then it's like, well, we, we'll do this, but we don't formally endorse them. And then about three years ago, they just suddenly started to get a life of their own. And the Lancet now formally endorses them. The WHO has just endorsed them, which is fantastic. Many, many journals have signed up. Elsevier signed up all their journals, so that's a huge swathe of journals. And through Ease, we've signed up more journals. So one element is that journals endorse. And then the next one is, is that actually having an effect? And do we have time to monitor? But we have been doing this slowly, implementing them for some time at Lancet Journals. And so my, my memory is, first of all, when I started editing journal papers, people would say, there were 100 participants in this study and 60 of them were men. Okay. Then the sort of feminists came free. So the women authors would say, there were 100 people in this study and 40 of them were women. And we're kind of like, could you tell us both? And, were th and, and that was sort of when people were really only giving you two options, male, female, men, women. But so in the table, we said, you know, this many women, this many men. And, and we don't need to do the maths. Don't make us do the maths to find the other one. And now that people are asking more questions, so it would be male, female, and prefer not to say other gender, non-binary. You know, we're not saying what you must ask. We're saying, but whatever you have asked, we want you to report that. And the same with race and ethnicity. If you're collecting ethnicity data, tell us what options were given. Give us the answers. And if you've if you've got detailed answers, perhaps stick them in the appendix and then just collate. So in, in Britain, you'll quite often come down to white, Asian, black British of some description. You know, they, they condense them. So I've just looked at one paper and, and the, I think they use the UK census data, which has lots and lots of options, but then they condense them down. So in the main paper, you might get two or three. So in the States, you get white, black, Latin. If you've got detailed answers, we want them in the appendix. And, and the reasons we're doing this, when I'm, when I'm teaching, I'm saying it's the reason we want all your data, even if they're not in the main paper, is that when people come to do meta-analyses, they need access to as much information as they can get. So in your study, you may not have had enough people of this particular ethnic background to even report because it might violate the small cell requirement. But if you add all these up, over 10 papers and someone does a meta-analysis and they can look at the individual patient data, then they go, oh, actually, we've now got data on 50 people and there's a small signal coming through there. So perhaps we should do a study to look at that group in particular. So we're pushing reporting to a higher level, which basically is more granularity, more information, because a lot of the times they have this information. You know, they, they knew what their patient, who their patients were. And we're just asking them to report those data so that, so that readers know and, and then we can use that information more. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Joan. Talking a little bit about diversity and specifically diversity in peer review, how do you see the relationship between diversity and the quality and the relevance of published research? Oh, that's interesting. Diversity and peer review is really interesting. So again, I've been at the Lancet 10 years and in all that time, we've really worked hard at getting more women reviewing. And in psychiatry, our numbers are pretty good. I should back that up with a number. I think it's about 40% of our reviews are done by women. And but for a long time, we couldn't collect data. So, so actually at the end of every year, I had a spreadsheet of all my peer reviewers and I would go through it and I would guess by name and the names I couldn't guess, I would email them or I would look online and you could see if they've got a picture or they're using pronouns. And and if not, I literally emailed mainly the Chinese authors and said, excuse me, I'm, I'm doing some data collection. Are you are you male or female? Of course, now I would say, do you describe yourself? <laughs> and, and now Elsevier are collecting those data. So Lancet Journal is published by Elsevier in Editorial Manager and we're collecting data so we can run the statistics on who these people are. So we're trying to get more, more women and we can know and more diverse. We're also collecting ethnicity data now, but I'm not sure 
we we try in the sense of we're trying to think of people who don't look like the standard white UK US male. I don't think we're ever going to get to a point of view where we're able to scan a list and say, oh, I need somebody here. What we do do, and all Lancet journals do this, is we do look for people from the country where the study was done or from the community where the study was done. If the study is, is in Sri Lanka, we need a Sri Lanka reviewer. If it's in India, we need an Indian reviewer. Uh, and sometimes it is literally just that, and it's a reviewer from India. I mean, how representative is that? It's a massive, massive country and very diverse. You know, in some ways, it's probably easier to get a Chinese reviewer who might represent much more of China, but India is so diverse. But we're trying. And, and then, you know, I think over time, as we build our networks, we'll get more granular and go, well, actually, OK, but, but we need somebody from this state in India or who's... So with database studies, it's we need someone who knows the database so they can look at it and say, yeah, but this, this database doesn't contain that sort of information or, or these services don't work in that way. The more you get into healthcare, social sciences, the more relevant the setting becomes. If you're dealing with molecular biology, it's the same. And it doesn't matter where you are, you know, the molecules should be behaving and the cells should be behaving in the same way. But as soon as you get up to people, they vary immensely. So we do that, but it, it's it's quite interesting with the statistics because we always try, we try to get reviewers from different countries and from low middle income countries, but a lot of them have dual affiliations. So you know, we invite somebody to review because, say, they're working in Delhi and then they've got a joint affiliation with Harvard and they, they put on the system, they're from Harvard. Like, no, you've just ruined my statistics. <laughs> But they're very proud of their Harvard affiliation. They can know what your Denny affiliation. So that makes the data collection quite quite difficult. Or you get somebody. So we, I've had people who've reviewed for me when they've been working in a low middle income country, and then they go off to a high income country on a fellowship, and they go to the states, and they're at Harvard or somewhere. And then and they get and I thought, oh, now do I not use them because they're no longer based? But I hopefully. They still have the knowledge of the country in which they trained, and hopefully they'll go back. You know, they're going to do more training in, in this country and get more experience, and then they're going to go back and serve their home community. So I should keep, we as a journal should keep building that relationship. You have to sort of not worry about my statistics at the end of the year. It's what's the message and what are the voices and we're trying to hear and bring through. Well, that's, that's fascinating, Joan, and I think a lot of, listeners would also appreciate because, for example, even for me, I wasn't aware of all the efforts that are happening behind the scenes in terms of, you know, just managing and maintaining this. Because you mentioned a couple of things, a question came to my mind, which is that, is it safe to assume that a lot of the journals would have similar challenges when they are tackling diversity in peer review? Or is it, like you mentioned, maybe there are subject area nuances also which play out? For example, you know, if you're dealing with people, obviously, it's just going to be a slightly different challenge versus maybe something in molecular biology. Is it the same, more or less? Yeah. I mean, I, I only really know a bit about life sciences and more about medical sciences and, and mainly psychiatry. But if you think of many other disciplines, so ecology, agricultural sciences, in any of the applied sciences, they're going through again to settings and being important. I mean, even engineering. You know, if, if you're on the structural bit of building a bridge, it's probably the same. But if you're actually thinking about, I need to build a bridge over this river, that's going to have other implications. So I think that the real hard sciences, physics, some of chemistry, molecular cell biology, yeah, the lab sciences, they, they're not, those should be the same globally. But as soon as you get people, systems involved, the real world, nature, you know, climate change, um, all of these questions, they affect people and you need to have the voices and the people affected by it. So when I talk to people at ease conferences or, or editors of other psychiatry journals, and you know, sometimes they say, oh, it's all right for you because you're the Lancet and you've got a big name and everything. And I go, I know, and we have. And, and I'm very lucky because we're full-time. So my team and I, we're full-time staff. So we do have time to go, right, I've thought of my first three or four reviewers and they're all men so I'm going to keep thinking and thinking of some women and do a bit more research but 
my message is I, I think as a as an industry as an editorial journal industry we don't use early career researchers enough we do at lancet so we there are various levels so it can be that we invite someone to review and they so again we now have the facility when they fill in the review an editorial manager the senior reviewer can say i did have help from x and that person can be named and then they're identified they're caught in the system and we you know might use them next time but also sometimes i would invite someone to review and they'll come back and say i'm too busy but you know i've got this good phd student postdoc trainee if they're recommended by someone i trust or someone who even just has a big reputation, then I will just use them. And, and what do you have to lose as an editor? At worst, you get a weak review. And, and then you go, okay, I need another one. And you've lost a little bit of time. But at best, you get somebody else who does a, a good review. And then you go, okay, I can use them again. Because they're, A, they're very passionate because it's their topic. And they have more time because they're not receiving 10 email invitations to review every day. So I think as a group of editors, we do need to just reach down. So there's reaching out for geographical diversity, but I think there's also reaching down to early career researchers and encouraging them to do review. And it, you know, sometimes it might be they've, they've done a good review. We can give them feedback. We can give training on peer review. You know, ESA has got fantastic resources. We do a lot of training and outreach and because we need that we need the whole research community to be engaged in peer review because there's so much research going on that can't of people at the top they can't do it all and they shouldn't be doing it for any reason moving on from some of the challenges that you mentioned joan talking a little bit about rewards and recognition how can journals effectively implement review recognition programs to incentivize quality peer review so we've done two things. So the Lancet journals, we always publish a list of the reviewers for the previous year. So an annual list, thank you to our reviewers. And we do a few little stats. We've had this many reviewers from these countries, et cetera. I have talked with people at smaller journals and they say, we can't do that. But I would encourage people to, to name them when you can, because that's external recognition. Elsevier has started a, a reviewer certificate program. And I was really surprised that they just have to email me and say, can I have a certificate? And I forward it and somebody sends a certificate. And I had a request from a professor at an American university. I don't feel like, I actually didn't know her and I said, I'm surprised she needs a certificate. And she said, my university wants to know what we're doing with our time. And I need to have credit for my peer review time for her university, even though she, you know, acclaimed professor. So... As publishers, you know, that's very easy for us to do. It, it doesn't, we, we can do that. I think beyond that, it's quite hard. I think, you know, reviewers, particularly early career reviewers, they can learn a lot by reading the other review. An editorial manager, as I understand it now, it's set up. Once you have submitted your review, you can see the other review. So you can go in and you can say, did other people agree with me? Did they raise points I hadn't thought of? You, know, you can you can start to see that. I do sometimes think about that. So so generally, if it goes well at peer review, we invite the authors to revise. It comes back. We try not to get too much re-review because we don't want to overload our reviewers and we don't want to delay things. So we quite often go back to the statistics reviewer, and we'll often go back to one of the clinical reviewers because we we publish a comment for each research article, and that's usually written by one of the reviewers. So if we give it to them to re-review, then they can have a look, they can see how the authors have responded to their comments, and then they're geared up to, to write the link comment if we accept the paper. But sometimes I think, okay, we should also invite the junior reviewer to re-review. And I might, or we do this with our lived experience panel, and say, you don't have to re-review, but if you accept the invitation, you will see the author's response to the reviewers. And you'll be able to download that file, which includes the responses to the other reviewers and also the responses to your own comments. And you can see, you know, has that happened? So, so I think it's, it's just taking a tiny bit of time when you're just doing that thing. 
should I invite that person and, and, and not just hit the button and say invite them to re-review, but, but just write that little sentence to say, you don't have to re-review if you don't want to, but this will give you access to feedback that you might find useful. And, and again, I, I just think, you know, then that reviewer is now really benefiting. They can go, they don't have to. I have no idea how many of them do it or not. But they, you know, they don't write gushing emails saying, oh, Joan, thank you. That was really nice. But you hope they do. And then next time you invite them, they're going to say, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll do that because they helped me out. And I enjoyed reviewing for the journal, not just because I got a decent paper because it was a decent journal, but the journal made the process feel human. You know, and, and my team do that. They develop relationships with peer reviewers and they, they, they just write little chatty things and not just hitting that button in a reference man in a editorial management system that just that just making a tiny bit of time to make the reviewers feel appreciated at the other end. Absolutely. No, I think thank you for sharing that, Joan. I think that's a that's a very useful best practice. Moving on, uh, these days I think there's no conversation that is complete uh, till you don't talk a little bit about AI. So just uh, from your perspective on the whole ethical considerations associated with the use of AI by authors and reviewers, how do you think journals should approach these considerations in their editorial practices? Okay, I'm, I'm going to speak for me now because I'm, as you can imagine, there's this huge amount, well, there's a lot going on in the whole scholarly publishing system and there's a lot going on internally. We are seeing papers coming through where people are declaring that they have used AI to write the paper. And we're allowing that. So I am speaking as Lancet journals. They are allowed to use AI, but they must declare that they should declare it. And then they have to declare that people, the authors, the named authors take responsibility. And I think nearly all the journals and publishers globally have said AI cannot be an author because they cannot take responsibility for the content of the paper. So I think we're all sort of there. And then it's it's a tool. And in, in uh, the Lancet we're discussing, you know, it's not that dissimilar to hiring a professional editor and a professional medical writer. I mean, professional medical writers and editors may have more insights, but in terms of tidying up the language, I think that's fine. And, and somewhere where I think AI has a real future is in writing the abstract. Because authors are not good at writing abstract. They're better with structured abstracts. I didn't used to like structured abstracts, but I've come round to them and they they do mean that people can put things in the right places. But you know, that's perfect for just saying just use AI. You know, and we could use it in house. You know, you don't even have to say the author has to write, you could just say just send us your paper these days. And and you could you could all see a little tool built in that would read the paper and would generate the abstract for us. And then we'd have control over that as so I think it's it's useful in that sense, but beyond that, I don't know, and I, I just I'm just aware, like everyone else is, that there's so much going on out there, and I don't know. I think it's being open, sharing information about what's going on, but all we can do is collect signatures to say, I'm an author on this paper and I take responsibility. What's that worth? We had a paper, we published a paper a few years ago, and. There was one sentence in it that just said that ADHD was a brain disorder. Well, the people who don't like thinking of ADHD as a brain disorder got very upset. So there were a website in the US calling for this paper to be retracted and everything. Huge hoo-ha. And, and I was talking, and eventually it did die down. They, they were calling for the paper to be retracted. We didn't retract the paper, and eventually they, it just died away. But it was literally this one sentence in the abstract in the discussion, and I was talking with one of the authors on it, and it was it was a paper that had I don't know, I don't know thirty forty authors, and I said, did you did you see that? Did you sort of think about? It? And they went, oh no, I don't I, I didn't read the paper. I said, I have a form with your signature on that says you've read this paper, and you're like, oh yeah, don't read all the papers with my name on. <laughs> so. And I and I think that's true. Now, if you think of the consortia type papers, how much of it? And what would you read? You would you would sort of scan 
the abstracts and the key findings or the bit that your research reported wouldn't I mean I understand you know again people are people they're human and they're very busy and and to, to expect them to proofread in great detail every single paper and sorry I'm speaking as me now because I'm standing <laughs> it's not politically correct but we live in the real world and the real world now has AI in it so we we have to accept it's there people are going to use it most hopefully will use it advantageously and to the benefit of everybody and there'll be people who use it in less good ways either intentionally or unintentionally and and all we can do is as as editors we come back to our gatekeeper function and try to put structures in place to guide good practice and try to identify poor practice luckily it's more of a publisher question than an editor question we say and bounced it upstairs (laughs) <laughs> no, but I think that's a useful perspective, Joan, and, and uh, I'm, I'm quite uh, happy to hear that, you know, Lancet in particular, and I think a lot of other publishers as well, has embraced uh, AI and are allowing authors to use that. I think the whole space is evolving almost every day, and we're seeing more and more, both positive use cases and, and some of the other concerns also being raised by folks. In light of use of AI, one of the concerns that has been coming up in a lot of publisher-led conferences is there's going to be a huge increase in volumes. Uh, This is going to put more pressure on the editorial teams. There is a lot of development happening in terms of automating a lot of, it could be the manual checks, it could be plagiarism and research integrity. What is your take on the whole automation and the development of technological tools? which I don't think the idea is to replace the human checks, but could it help in being the first pass for a lot of these papers and then maybe the humans are involved only in what essentially are flagged as real issues? Yeah, I think so. And I, and I'm, all the publishers are, are working on this. And that, that's why I said it's a publisher-led thing. It, it's got to be system-wide. It, it's not an individual editor sitting at a, at a particular journal. So I, I think... Those of us who work for the big publishers, we can just sit back and let them do that. I think if, if you're at a small independent publisher, that's more difficult. You know, you haven't got the resources. I think all you can do then is is follow industry standards. You know, you've got to keep up with the report and see what the others are doing and and just follow ease guidelines, ICMJ guidelines, you know, other industry leaders who are, who are doing this and, and you may not disagree you may not agree with them you know you you, you can still you, you're independent that that's part of it you want to hang on to your independence but that is the problem these days that these issues get bigger and bigger you know dealing with predatory journals dealing with paper mills dealing with plagiarism that they're not something that one journal can handle that they're, they're just swamped so it has to be system wide, and you know that's the irony is that those those major publishers they're using AI to combat AI. You know they're using AI in many good ways to improve systems and flow and and everything. I mean even going back to choosing peer review, um, the AI input into there to help us get a more diverse with peer review. A sort of analogy would be plagiarism. So we're all used to plagiarism checkers. And we get an authenticate report or another system and it generates a number. But again, I come back to you as the editor then need to go in and have a look. Sometimes it's a really high number. You think, oh, no, 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 we've got to keep it. But then it's a preprint. And then, oh, okay, it's a preprint, that's fine. And sometimes it's, you know, our, our authenticate things meant to have references turned off, but it can be methods, it can be... If you've got a long list of authors and they happen to have done another paper, you know, got a 20 author paper and it's one of the series they're churning out, that that's two or three pages that looks exactly the same as, as something else. So you need as a person to go in there and scatter it. And we have it in psychiatry, you know, if, if you list disorders. So we looked at attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, schizophrenia spectrum disorder, da 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 you know, when they write them out in full, again, you've got two or three lines that there's just saying this is a list of disorders, but it looks the same and it's been cited somewhere else. So, so you just need to go in as a person and go, oh, okay, that number looks a bit high, but no, that's okay, that's okay. Oh, I think it's okay. 
I mean, we're lucky. We get very little plagiarism at the Lancet. We, we've had a couple, but on the whole, it, it's it's good. But but it is. So I think it's the same with the AI tools. And, and I suppose that's the problem, especially for someone like me who doesn't really want to engage with it, is how much am I as an editor going to need to learn? Then my, my publisher is introducing these systems. Do I just leave it with them and trust them completely? Or are they now going to say, yes, we have this system that you as the editor still need to look at something. And I, and I have no, I don't know where, where we are with that. You know, we haven't had any information and it, and it might be that individual editors, you know, I'm, I'm lucky my deputy editor is really techie. So if it, it gets to something like that, it'll be, sorry, could you go and do this? <laughs> And uh, yeah, you know, we all need to stay abreast and be aware. And there's there's plenty of industry things that that can do that. But don't get too scared. By it. I mean, you could read blogs and blogs and blogs on AI and publishing, and 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 you won't have got any further down the line than than you were before you started. So at some point, just go and do your work, and then come back occasionally and check in and go, how we do it. Yeah, no, I think that's an important piece of advice, Joe. And I think typically, as it happens with with any huge trend that is emerging. There's a lot of fear right now. People are worried. People are kind of maybe building or fearing in their minds, at least like a doomsday scenario and AI and, and everything's going to be, uh, you know, taken over. But you're absolutely right. I think there has to be that perspective building from time to time. And it's still evolving. And we just have to monitor. We have to keep abreast. Of course, we can't ignore it as well. But at the same time, probably not be consumed by it. So thank you for sharing that. With with so much of vast experience that you had, uh, Joan, what would be the advice that you'd give to early career researchers and even aspiring journal editors who are very passionate about promoting diversity, advancing mental health awareness, or even contributing meaningfully to the field of mental health research through academic publishing? I came to mental health research very late. So I, I worked in life science publishing and then I wandered into medical publishing and then I was given the psychiatry book list to look after it widely and I didn't really want it. No. And then I came to enjoy it more and then I got the job at Lance Psychiatry and now I absolutely love it. And it's fascinating because it's just people. So mental health researchers, I mean, I, I think you're in an amazing field. Yeah, just just go ahead and really enjoy it. And it's so diverse. I mean, I I met someone and they they were doing something that they were using. I think they were using an AI tool to help people with a certain disorder to then get on to do something in their daily lives. You know, it wasn't medical at all. It was social. But then they were bringing this AI computing perspective to it. And it's early days. It, it you know, it was very. PhD study and you just think oh yeah but there's that's that's where things are going to happen in in the future so I think it's but there's just so many opportunities and it's not just clinical trials and systematic reviews I mean we publish a lot of systematic reviews they're they're forever trying to sort of pull the signals out of the data we've got because our data aren't great we're not cardiology and oncology We, we have small trials and people drop out so Clinical trials in mental health are really hard to do because the people are really ill and they don't want to stay in a trial and keep coming back and being measured and set. But, you know, the standard's risen. So it's, it, in, in the 10 years that we've run Lancet Psychiatry, the, the quality of papers, not, not just that we're guessing because we've gone up the ranks, but you can see it across all the journals because the conference presentations, the standards are, are really coming up. There's a lot more rigour in the studies. And so I think for doing mental health research, you know, it, it is that. So psychotherapy, now the trials, they're, they're using manuals. They're very heavily prescribed what's doing on. They are looking for adverse events, which they never used to do. So there's, there's a lot going on. It's developing fast. So I, I just think if, if, yeah, if you're an early career researcher and, and you're wondering, you know, is mental health a field? I think it's a brilliant field to be in. And the same for people going into the, medicine and it's a great discipline to, to actually practice medicine in. I mean from an editing perspective I think it's very difficult to in, to talk to young people about careers in editing because we don't know where we're going but as I've said many times in this interview I think people are still there so I don't think AI is going to take all our job away they will change I think you still need 
some language skills. And it doesn't mean, well, it doesn't mean you need to be perfect at English. I think you need language skills in the sense of communicating clearly. And that can be with short sentences and simple words. So you haven't got to write beautiful English prose, and, and to be honest, we are really talking about English language publishing. But break it down, keep it short, keep it simple, and what's the message? And and you you as an editor can help authors to, to put that message through. And to ask them, sorry, what do you mean there? And you just read and go, no, I don't know what you mean. No, please explain that more clearly. Well, the author knows what they mean, but you as an editor to just pull that out and say, no, what, what does that mean? And in terms of careers, I think we'll be around, but I think you've got to be nimble. And but I think that's that's a generational thing. You know, when when I was young, you you were still you, at school. It was we were going to train for a career, and that would be your career for forty years, and then you'd retire. And it's broken up more. I mean, I became an editor, and they don't do editing in careers advice at school. And I did it by you know I, I fell into editing because I tried science, and I'm not very good at it. So I, I, I think that the generations coming through are more thinking, I will have a job for three to five years, and then that might change. So there will be careers in science, science publishing, but they may look different to sort of classic one. And that, I mean, you see that within the big publishers, that they have development. I'm, I was going to say IT departments, but then you always think about the person who's helping you set up your laptop. But no. But the ones who are developing these systems with AI and tools and you know, trying to make the whole process more efficient. So I meet people and, and they work in publishing. We meet them at ease conferences and they, they're, they're working. You think, oh, really? You do that? Okay, you do that, that. Right, yes, never thought of that. So there's a huge variety out there. And I think it's just yeah, getting out and asking around and meeting people and finding those jobs. There will be some. Absolutely. And so that's a wrap for today's episode of Insights Exchange. Thank you, Joan Marsh, for your valuable insights into the world of academic publishing, especially within the domain of mental health research. Your inputs on the importance of diversity in peer review, the ethical use of AI, and maintaining a balance between innovation and traditional practices have offered practical insights into the evolving landscape of scholarly communication. And finally, thank you, Listeners, for joining us, don't forget to subscribe to Insights Exchange for more enlightening conversations with leaders in academia and beyond. Until next time, keep exploring new horizons of knowledge.